Hello programmers, this is part one of the discussion on C++ classes and objects. Part one covers life before objects as implemented in the C language and an introduction to classes and objects as used in C++. Separate discussion of the biggest three properties of objects, encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism are covered in parts two, three, and four. If you're watching this as a video, links to the other parts of the discussion should be available in the comments section on YouTube. My name is Dan, and I am going to make a fortune starting my own online sales company using some object-oriented programming techniques that include classes, objects, encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. I'm going to name my company Dan is on. I don't think anybody will figure out how I came up with this clever name. My logo is special. Uh, it has teeth. I'm going to be the biggest retailer on the internet. I will start by selling books. I just know everybody wants books and lots of them. I was in the library yesterday and saw lots of people using the computers, but nobody checking out books. They probably couldn't find the books they wanted because the card catalog was empty. I didn't ask them, but they're probably online buying books. Yeah, I bet that's what they are doing. I am ready to help them out and get rich doing it. I need a computerized way of keeping track of inventory for my fantastic get rich company. I could use a collection of parallel arrays to store inventory information about books. I can use the same index position in each array to give me all the information I need for an individual book. The same position in each array will be used to hold a piece of information for each book. For example, the book The Sound and the Fury is located at position 4 in each array. One array holds the item ID, another array holds the title, another one holds the author, and more arrays hold the price and number of items in stock. Separate arrays are needed because every item in an array must be the same data type. I'm using an array of C strings for the title of the books, and another one for the author. An array of doubles for the price because it needs to hold digits past the decimal point, and one more array of integers to keep track of the number of each book in stock. Although I could process my inventory using this method, it would be much better to have all of the information about an individual book grouped together rather than all the titles grouped together, authors grouped together, and so on. Having the parallel arrays also makes it messy and things can get unorganized. If I end up adding or removing a title, I need to make sure that each array gets updated in the same place or everything will get messed up and the title for a book may not match up to the author, price, or in stock value. The discussion of classes and objects starts with the C language and how it has a better way of organizing data in something called struct. This is short for structured record. Some languages just call it record. A record is defined with a struct statement and can have several fields of different data types. The type def statement is used to create a new data type book from the struct statement to create the data structure and the new data type at the same time. In C, the struct and type def can be defined separately or they can be combined at the same time when defining a structured record. Now that we have a structured record defined in C, here is how we can put the data into a record and access the data that is in the record. Give the name of the record and then use the dot operator to identify the field. You can either use literals to fill the record when it is being created, or you can fill the record when the program is running. The my book record is defined using literals at the same time the record is created. The second book record is defined with no data, and then data is put into the record when the program runs. Here I can see how the title, author, price, and in stock values are placed in the record named second book. The Microsoft compiler requires the use of a secure version of strcpy underscore s 
other compilers used the original string copy, str, cpy. The printf statement also shows the use of the dot operator when displaying the title of the two books. The name before the dot operator is the name of the record for the book, and the value after the dot operator is the data field that belongs to that book. Just as a side note on the double data type, the double data type does a great job when converting from an integer to a double without digits past the decimal place. We need to remember that digits past the decimal are a very close approximation because numeric values are stored in binary. There is not always an exact conversion from decimal to binary of the digits past the decimal. When I looked at how 20.49 was stored in memory, it came out as 20.4899999999999844, which is as close as it can get to 20.49. When displayed, it will be rounded to 20.49, so everything looks good, even though secretly in memory it is not exactly what we specified. Warning. Do not use the double data type in a for loop or a while loop to count the number of times through the loop. You could be off. Use only the int data type to control a loop or index through an array. Okay, back to the discussion on classes and objects. An array of structured records can also be declared and even initialized at the same time. C does not keep track of the size of an array as part of the language itself. The number of records in the array can be calculated by getting the size of the entire array in bytes and dividing it by the size of each record in bytes. Int book count equal size of open parentheses book list close parentheses divided by size of book semicolon. That's the way I compute the number of elements in an array. Here is a for loop that displays the number of items in stock, price, and title of each book in the array. Not all the fields are being displayed by the printf statement, and not even in the same order as when the record was created. Printf's format statement shows percent %3D to print an integer three positions wide for the in stock field. It has percent %7.2F to print the price using seven positions on the display with two digits past the decimal and percent minus 30.30s to print a string that is left justified. See the minus sign? That is 30 positions wide on the display. Here is a sample output from the program. If you are really interested in seeing the code for the C program, it can be found at program-info.net slash capital C++ slash downloads slash capital C++ capital classes, capital and capital objects, slash code, slash capital C dash book list dot C. Watch the capitalization. Let's start with an introduction to classes and objects which provides the foundation for object-oriented programming, commonly called OOP. We can start with defining we can start with defining some of the terms before discussing objects in detail, starting with the terms class and object. A class statement is more like a design and a blueprint. It says how something is to be constructed. We could have a blueprint and then build several houses from the blueprint. Here is a blueprint for a camera with many objects built from it. An object is a thing. The class definition identifies the variables that would be given space in memory. The objects are created from the class definition. The class also contains code that can act on those data members. Once a class has been defined, we can have as many objects as we want based on the class. There are many times in programming that we take English words and give them new meanings. An object is an instance of a class. The verb to instantiate means making an object from a class definition. Instantiation is the process of making objects. You may hear these words tossed around when people are talking about object-oriented programming. So it is good to have an idea of what they mean. One of the biggest goals in object-oriented programming is to hold all the data and the code that works on it in one piece. 
this will be the object. The data that belongs to an object is referred to by several names, all of which mean the same thing, field, attribute, property. These can be things like integers, doubles, characters, strings, or even other objects. The code that belongs to an object is called a method. Methods can either be like functions, which return a piece of data, or a subroutine procedure that does not return anything. I am creating a class definition in one file named book1.h to provide the structure to hold the data for each individual book that gets instantiated. The class definition in book1.h also has code that gets executed when a book1 object gets instantiated. I named this class book1 because when I continue the discussion of C++ objects, I will be modifying the class definition to include encapsulation and later inheritance and polymorphism. I am referring to this set of code modules as version-1. This way, I will be able to keep track of which version of the class file I am working on. Although I am providing the code for version 1, I suggest that if you download it to examine it in more detail, that you discard version 1 when you start looking at version 2. I am creating another file named book1test.cpp that will be used to instantiate some book1 objects, place data in them, and test the objects by displaying the data. Although the code could be placed in a single file for a small project, I'm going to start using multiple files in the project so that you can see how the project is built when the size of the program grows. For this example, I'm creating a project using Microsoft Visual Studio and naming the project Book One Test. Next, get the code from the website for Book One Test.cpp, copy and paste it into Visual Studio as Book One Test.cpp. Create a new header file in the project and put the code for book1.h from the website in the file. Looking at Visual Studio's project frame, we can see how the project is organized. Book1.test.cpp is a source file and book1.test.h is a header file. A similar sequence of events needs to take place if you are using a different IDE such as CodeBlocks, Eclipse, NetBeans, or Apple's Xcode. The pragma once at the top of the book1.h file tells the compiler that this file should only be processed one time even if there are multiple source files that have pound include quote book1.h quote. The class definition starts with the word class followed by an open curly brace. The class definition ends with a closed curly brace and a semicolon. It is common practice to capitalize the first letter of a class's name and even a requirement for Java. Public colon is an access modifier. I will cover access modifiers later in the discussion. Note that this is a colon character, not a semicolon that ends a statement, block of code, or a class definition. Several data members are being defined in class book 1. A string for the title, a string for the author, a double for the price, and an integer for the number of books in stock. Since I'm using the string data type, the pound include open angle bracket string close angle bracket statement is needed at the top of the file. Each time an object is instantiated from a class definition, memory is allocated in RAM for that object. Also, something special happens. A class definition can provide a constructor method that is executed as soon as the object has memory allocated for its data members. That way, we can place code in the constructor if anything needs to happen when the object is first being built. The name of a constructor in C++ is the same name as the class. There are two types of constructors. The default constructor has no arguments and a constructor that has arguments. In this example, the default constructor sets the string variables to empty strings and the numeric variables to zeros. A second constructor has four arguments. It is called if the main program instantiates a book one object with the same list of parameter data types. The for argument constructor copies the data it received for title, author, price, and in stock into the object's data members. 
If you are creating a constructor that has arguments, you should also create a default constructor, a copy constructor, and a destructor method. The copy constructor and destructor are covered much later. The definition of a constructor from en.wikipedia.org is as follows. A constructor is a special type of subroutine that is called when an object is created. It prepares the new object for use, often accepting arguments that the constructor uses to set required member variables. A constructor resembles an instance method, but it differs from a method in that it has no explicit return type. Constructors have the same name as the declaring class. They have the task of initializing the object. A properly written constructor leaves the resulting object in a valid state. C++ and Java allow overloading the constructor with the same name, but with different number of arguments or data types. When an object is instantiated, each object gets its own copy of the data members. In this example, two objects are created from the class definition my book and second book. Each object gets its own copy of title, author, price, and in stock. Let's look at an example of a main program that has instantiated two book one objects named first book and second book. The first book object does not have a parameter list. Therefore, the default constructor gets called when the object is instantiated. The default constructor initializes the string data members to empty strings and the numeric data members are initialized to zeros. Assignment statements inside main are used to set the member data for first book. Look at first book dot title equals quote Google gets Googled quote semicolon. First book identifies the object, followed by the dot operator, and then the name of the member data that gets updated. The next few examples in main update the other data member variables for author, price, and in stock. Now, let's look at how the member data is initialized for the object named second book. The data for title, author, price, and in stock are passed as string, string, double, int when the object is instantiated. This same sequence of data types matches the for argument constructor in the class definition. The sequence and data types in the parameter list is referred to as its signature. Since the data types passed in the parameter list match the same data types in the for argument constructor, this is the constructor that is activated. The for argument constructor does all the work to individually copy each of the arguments from the list into the respective data members for the object. The arguments listed in the for argument constructor are named T, A, P, and I. The data received in the argument named T is saved in the object's member data variable named title using an assignment statement. The rest of the arguments are saved in the object's data variables in a similar manner. When the program runs, the cout statement displays a message followed by the title variable from the object. First book dot title identifies the object and the title data member with the dot operator separating the object name from the member data name. For example, the cout statement cout less than less than quote my first book is quote less than less than first book dot title less than less than endl displays the string my first book is quote and then the title member data from the object named first book which is google gets googled before we go here is an array that has been initialized with book one objects the data type for the array is book one and the name of the array is book list. The first open curly brace starts the array initialization and the closing curly brace and semicolon end the initialization. Each element in the array starts and ends with curly braces. Since each element in the array has four initializers of type string, string, double, and int, C++ calls the for argument constructor and builds an object in memory for each element in the array.
This is totally cool. The for loop uses the variable i to step through the list starting at i equals 0 and i less than book count, where book count was set to the number of elements in the array after the array was created. In the cout statement, book list open square bracket i close square bracket dot title retrieves the contents of the title field of the array element selected by i as the loop starts at zero and increments i to the end of the array. This is what the output looks like. It displays the title field of my book and second book and then the title fields of each book from the book list array. This is the end of the C++ OOP discussion that covers an introduction to classes and objects. Check out the next discussion. Part 2 covers encapsulation.